You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for TWIFO this week in futures options, the program where the name pretty much says it all. We're going to break on the week that was and indeed still is on the futures options side of the fence. Maybe we'll talk some ag, some metals, some energy, maybe some crypto, some equities. You never know what's going to sneak onto the show Every week. That's why you have to tune in. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting Options Insider Radio Network coming at you. Usually a couple of shows a day there on the network. This week being the exception, of course, we were off for the Memorial Day holiday here in the U.S. on Monday, but making up for it over there on the pro side with pro Q&As, options oddities. Just did our Options Insider Pro Trading Crate giveaway for the month of May. Where do you get entered to win all that awesome stuff we're giving away? Plus, get access to those exclusive shows. Plus, get access to any live show you want during the week and a whole bunch more. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to begin your journey to the dark side. And let's see who's joining us as we journey to the dark side together. I'm very pleased to welcome once again to the CME Group and FTSE Russell Hot Seat, our old friend, Mr. Dan Gramza, the president of Gramza Capital Management. Dan, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. It has been too long. It's great to be with you, Mark. Exciting times. Looking forward to exploring these markets with you. A lot to explore. Really quickly, Dan, at the top of the show here, before we get into the movers and shakers and all that fun, it's been a little while since you joined us. It was pretty much the end of March so uh, multiple months in the rear view mirror. A lot has gone on in the broad markets and in the commodity space in particular. What's been catching your eye and lighting up your tape since the last time we chatted, sir? Well, I think the, the thing that we hear so much about 
which is the Ukraine uh, war situation, uh, which has really matured since you and I spoke last. It's the, I think, the tsunami of economic impact of that invasion hasn't been felt yet. And it will be felt towards the end of this year. And a, a couple of reasons for that. If we look at, well, let's just, let's pick one. Let's talk about eggs just quickly. Uh, if you think about wheat, well, you know, they, they plant wheat in uh, Ukraine and Russia. They supply about 30% of the global supply. Uh, who's going to plant that wheat? In fact, they've already harvested some wheat or it should have been harvested. So who's going to harvest it? How are they going to sell it? How are they going to move it? it a lot of people said, well, let's just hook up railroads and send it on that way instead of by sea. The issue is that Ukraine's railroads are Russian dimensions. Europe is smaller. So you can't just immediately go to another country. Uh, I think the impact of what should be planted right now in the spring for corn, you know, Ukraine supplies 60% of the corn to the, to the EU. That's not being planted. And if they do plant it, who's going to harvest it? Uh, that's going to be a tricky bit. And then how do you send it out? The other aspect, uh, I think that's important. Oh, let's just talk about wheat just one more, for one more second. And that is, if we think about where does that fit in? If you look at the countries that are de- impacted by this in terms of their their product life cycle and, and feeding their people. Um, you know, Ukraine and Russia, 30% of the global wheat supplies. Egypt, watch Egypt. Countries that are at risk. You know, when Egypt had the Arab Spring, that was because the cost of a loaf of bread increased. It, it, it is a big deal in that part of the world to have bread, to have wheat. And Egypt is the world's largest importer of wheat. They have more demand than any other country. 70% of that of Egypt's wheat comes from uh, Russia and Ukraine. So it's going to have a tremendous impact. 50% of the global world food program that feeds 125 million people, 50% of that comes from the Ukraine. That's not going to be happening. 78% of Turkey's wheat imports come from Russia and another 9% from Ukraine. And Turkey takes that wheat and processes it and sends it out. It, it's one of their major Turkey's uh, exports, or I should say Turkey, the new name for it. But anyways, <laughs> that's going to have a big impact there. And so we haven't felt that yet. And, you know, there's other areas. When we think about energy, we hear a lot about crude oil and natural gas, but there's a lot of other areas that have a tremendous impact that this conflict we're going to feel. And and where I I think of it is, let's talk about fertilizer. Russia, major exporter of potash, ammonia, uh, urea, and those, that fertilizer it's going to have a huge, huge global impact. You know, if you look at Russia and Belarus, they account for about 40% of the global exports of potash last year. And that's one of the three key ingredients when it comes to fertilizer. So 22% of ammonia, 14% of urea, 13% of MAP, which is the semino ammonium phosphate, a key part of uh, fertilizer. Now, okay, Brazil, let's just pick a country, the world's largest exporter of soybeans. And they rely on imported fertilizers. And that accounts for 38% of their crop nutrients. So when people say, well, you know, there's a there is this wheat and corn shortage, but other countries can just produce more, grow more. Well, if I'm a farmer, can I afford to do that? I, could I expand? Maybe. But if I can't fertilize, am I going to get the return? Maybe not. 
So the assumptions that our food supply is going to expand accordingly uh, as we lose that food supply there, I, I'm concerned about that. I just don't see that automatically happening. So it is a big deal in terms of what can happen there. And just one other area, Mark, I'm, you got me thinking about these things, and it's sunflower oil. Probably not something that you and your listeners usually think about, but 75% of sunflower oil comes from uh, Russia and Ukraine. Right now, that should be planted. It's not being planted. And sunflower oil, to give you a perspective, is about 10% of all cooking oil. Now, that's one issue. And I'm going to bring this back home here in just a minute. Indonesia uh, is the world's largest palm oil exporter. And right now, they have banned exports because they're trying to control supply internally. They need it. They've got issues with inflation. So they're not exporting. So what does this mean? Palm oil out there? No, sunflower oil out there. It means bean oil. Soybean oil is going to feel that. So watch soybean oil as time goes on. You know, again, the, these crops, sunflower oil, um, sunflowers should be planted now. And they're not being planted. So they won't be harvested. And so that shortage, that's why I mean we're going to feel it down the road. And so for me, that I, I think there's more to come. Uh, just now, let's step away from the agricultural side. Going back to the conflict, Russia, number two largest supplier of platinum. Uh, Ukraine supplies more than 90%, 90% of semiconductor grade neon gas. And they use it in lasers, which is used in the semiconductor chip manufacturing. Holy Toledo, we're back to that issue, semiconductor chips. And if you don't have this uh, neon gas to produce those chips, we're going to have a problem again. Russia supplies 35% of the palladium used in chips. And the, and the thing is, we're already starting to see this, Mark. Uh, Volkswagen, BMW, they've closed assembly lines in Germany due to the shortages of wiring harnesses manufactured in Ukraine. You know, a tire manufacturer, Michelin, announced that it could close plants in Europe due to the logistics issues, issues created by the Russian invasion. So it reaches way beyond just energy and agricultural. There's other areas that we could see an impact, especially as time goes on and this conflict continues to grow. How did I know, Dan, uh, you, you were going to have a lot to add on the conflict? I'm we sorry. Have, no, I, I love yeah. it. Like I said, I love it. We could do the whole show right now if you want. We've already touched on a lot of segments, but let's kick it off the way we are yeah, want please. to do, sir. It is time for the Movers and Shakers Report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show listeners where we determine where we're going to kick off our journey this week to the light side, a.k.a. the upside and to the dark side. You guys can see this one for yourselves. It's, it's we. One of the only pretty much uh, premium reports from uh, the folks over there at Bantix you guys can get your hands on for free. Kick the tires and light the fires over there at CME Tweets it out. We tweet it out as well. If you looked at it this week, you'll see it's pretty much equidistant to the upside and to the dark side. So uh, kind of interesting bifurcation in the markets out there. And Dan, I love when you join us on the show because your your enthusiasm is so apparent. It, it just explodes through the microphone, sir. We don't even need to get into the segments. We could just dive into all of it at the top of the show. But... If we follow the format, sir, where should we begin our journey this week? To the light side or to the dark side? Let's do it to the light side. I had a feeling you're going to go that way, sir. All right. To the light side we go, listeners. And let's see. By the way, yeah. Actually, I've said it before. I will say it again. There are those top three offenders that we throw out there. You know, nat gas, lumber, and Bitcoin. Usually, you pick those three. You have a good chance of being right 
in one direction every week, if not multiple times. And it seems like we have one, <laughs> two, yes, all three of our frequent offenders. We have the trifecta represented in the movers and shakers this week. To the light side, we go first. Number five, it's one of the aforementioned offenders. It's Bitcoin, up 3.27% this week. It was number four in the other direction last week, off nearly 2.5%. Again, before you get all hot and bothered, 291 contracts. It's actually a decent week for those Bitcoin options, but not blowing the doors off out there. Number four, heating oil, back to the energy complex, up 4.47%. So a decent week for the heating oil. Again, before you get too excited, 808 contracts on the tape this week. So probably not heading out there. Number three, Arbob, another frequent offender. We talk about, at least on our movers and shakers, quite a bit, up 5.54%. You'll see... Why we don't talk about it on the show proper right now, because it only does about 1,400 contracts. Uh, number two, copper. We keep ticking up the options volume chain here. Back to the metals now. Copper up 6.16%. A little bit busier contract. 8,239 contracts on the tape right now. So, again, it's no euro dollars, but we could, if you are intrigued listeners, perhaps swing by there. And number one, with a light side bullet this week, up 10.88%. Feeder cattle up 10.88%. Good for 5,347 contracts this week, so probably not hanging out there. It's no lean hogs, which we know can do 40,000 contracts in a week, but still an intriguing one out there. To the dark side now we go. Uh, number five is oats off five and a quarter percent. Uh, Dan was just breaking down all the ags. I have a feeling we'll get back to those in a little bit. Oats was number three in the other direction last week, up 8.68%. And again, this is probably the most anemic on our list here, a whopping eight contracts on the tape for Oats. I don't know why Oats is such an anemic options contract, but say lobby. And number four, our other frequent offender there, Nat Gas, off 5.61%. It was number one to the upside last week, up a little over 11%. You know Nat Gas can do some paper, so he might be heading out there. Number three, Casey Wheat, off 6.21%. Number two in the same direction last week, off 5.08%. It's immediately usurped to the upside there. Number two, SRW wheat off 6.82%, a.k.a. Chicago wheat. That was number one to the dark side last week off five and a quarter percent. Uh, you know, SRW wheat can do some paper, so maybe we'll head out there. And then number one, our other frequent offender back on the list this week, dominating the dark side, lumber off 9.43%. It was number five in the same direction last week off 1.81%. Again, before you get all excited, it's done a whopping 34 contract, which is actually a fairly busy week for lumber. <laughs> but again, not a big options player. Uh, so, Dan, we're going to get to ags in a little bit. I got a feeling a lot of our listeners have been intrigued and watching all the stuff going on in the energy market. So I think we're going to head out there first. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody, welcome to the energy segment. You guys know where to go to follow along with these reports for yourselves. Seamegroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O, is the place to go. Then get on into that drop down. Go, it's alpha order, obviously, so you're going to go down three slots there to energy. And then you're going to go over to the product family, go down another three slots to nat gas. And right at the top of the product list, you will see natural gas. Dan, this is a product that has been on everyone's radar Ever since the invasion, it certainly has been dominating the tape pretty much since the last time you joined us back in March. What has been catching your eye in Nat Gas and indeed the energy complex, sir? Well, you know, when it comes to Nat Gas, that's a good one to pick, Mark. It, it befuddles me. And the reason I say that, this is a market that should be fairly straightforward in terms of what's happening. When we think about demand and we think about supply and the potential interruption of that, you know, we want to remember that the supply lines in Europe, from Russia to Europe, and there's a number of pipelines there, by the way, uh, they haven't been shut off. You know, and what amazes me is that Europe uh, spent $850 million a day uh, to Russia. And when it comes to energy, and that's going to be changing. And what we're seeing here for, for Nat Gas is I thought we'd be a lot higher. I thought we'd be trading above $10 by now. Uh, we haven't. We've gone sideways over for the last few days. But I have to tell you, if you're on the short side of that market, be careful. 
because I think over the next few months, as more and more countries are signing on of cutting the pipeline, in a sense, shutting down the flow from Russia to Europe, uh, that customer base is going to have a dent when it comes to Russia's income, uh, but also demand for nat gas. And things are improving. Our ability to send there, uh, send nat gas there. Almost all of our shipments now are going to Europe before they were going to Asia when it comes to nat gas. But the challenge we're having in our country is our ability to have enough capacity in terms of processing natural gas to make it liquefied. You know, they take natural gas and they squeeze it under pressure and get it very cold so those molecules don't bounce around as a gas and they have a liquid and they take special ships to send them and special processing. We're building new facilities to do this. But down in the Gulf Coast, that's our primarily out, primary outlet. And we're seeing more facilities being built in uh, Europe. Uh, Germany, by the way, who consumes 45% of their nat gas from Russia, they don't have an import facility for LNG. But other countries do around them. Poland does, for example. They build some. So we have the ability to start increasing and helping in terms of that replacement. But it, it's not an easy situation. So from my point of view, again, if I think about the next few months, I think we should see some upward pressure in that gas. I'm still bullish on that market. Crude oil, to me, is different. Uh, that market right now, I think a sideways move at these price levels, and I didn't think the, the nation supports this. You know, we had uh, OPEC today said they're going to increase their uh, output. To, uh, I think it was 800, no, 648,000 uh, barrels per day from the 400 and some they were doing before. That's going to help a bit. Crude oil to me should be around 115 to 110. So right now we're right about there. We're 116. Uh, so I, I think it's fairly priced. Uh, that's a, a different animal. To get above 120, if we trade back towards 120, you want to see it closing at 121, 122 that day. If you don't, look for a sideways move. And that's kind of what I'm looking for crude now. That 120 to 110 range, about a 10-hour range. Volatile is all get out. But I, I think it's fairly priced at this point. Let's get out to Nat Gas first. And you're right, Nat Gas taking a bit of a break. We mentioned it's off 5.61% since our last show, off 2.5% just since the start of this week, trading right around an 85 Right now, out there in that front future, listeners, which has about 25 days ago, that front contract. Also, where the lion's share of the paper went up this week, 25.6%. By the way, how much paper went up this week? It's about average, maybe a little bit light. Usually, we see around 400,000 contracts in nat gas this time of week, about 373 right now. So, we're right in that range. And again, about 25% of that going up in that front July contract. Vol wise, what's going on from a vol perspective? Vol coming in. It's down to about a 79. It was about seven points higher this time last week. So vol coming in, still obviously very volatile, very frothy. A 79 vol, nothing to sneeze at. And in terms of skew, we've seen a little bit of evolution since last week. Not so much on the puts, though. The puts are pretty much about the same. Last week, the puts 4.5% cheap. This week, 4.1% cheap. The calls last week were where the bid was, 4.2% bid. This week, they've been cut in half, 2.1% bid out there. So interesting evolution out there let's go out to what was the hot option and actually it wasn't in july that was actually in september looks like it was the four puts doing quite a bit of paper 22 almost twenty three thousand contracts going up in the four puts in september this week over pretty much two days eleven thousand two hundred on wednesday and eleven thousand two hundred today by the way why are we seeing a little bit less paper on that gas and in all these products this week? Because we had a truncated trading week. No trading here on Monday. So that explains why. If you if you factor that in, it's only three days for that gas. It's actually doing more volume than you would expect. All right, let's go to that. Uh, again, a lot of paper in the four puts. 11,000, most of that opening on Wednesday. And of course, 11,200 again today. Are they taking it back off? I don't know. We'll have to dig in a little bit to find out. 
it is interesting that the exact same amount of paper going up both days and also in the four puts in September. What do you think they're up to out there, listeners? You think they're just blasting away at some premium, looking to pick up some nat gas if it drops below $4 by September? Or is this kind of a, a panic move? They think a nat gas is going to retreat all the way back down to pretty much the pre-invasion levels down there. That would be a pretty low level back below the four handle by September. But again, there is some seasonality to nat gas. Usually, I think it's a little bit earlier in the year. But by September, I think we're usually starting to see the, the crank up into the fall. So uh, intriguing stuff, but still about 23,000 of these September four puts. I would not have expected that, which is why we run the numbers and do the show every week, listeners. Followed by number two, we have the seven half puts here in July. They did 13,000 contracts this week. The big day today, 9,300 today. Uh, not so much the rest of the week, only 2,400 on Wednesday, 1,400 on Tuesday. Mostly opening both of those, those days, I should say. And then a lot of paper today. Again, we don't know opening closing. I think we have a question about that a little bit later about the opening closing. So we will come back to that in the futures options feedback. We also saw action on the 10 calls, 11,433 of those to be precise. 4,200 today, 4,500 yesterday, 2,600 on Monday, opening throughout most of the week. And we obviously don't know about today's paper. Again, that gets back to what Dan was saying earlier on the 10 strike. Maybe some folks opening up a little bit upside in case we gap back up there or maybe they're feeling daring they're dangerous they're overriding on the 10 strike what do you folks think hit us up let us know are you guys up to anything out there in the nat gas options we want to hear from you guys as well so look really quickly see any other interesting or perhaps aberrant trades going up the 10 calls also active here in october six thousand there eight calls eight call three half puts active in june of next year interesting also active in may of next year as well so three halves maybe some folks looking all opening Hmm. perhaps some folks thinking we are retreating back to those levels also three half puts pretty active in october of next year and september so a big three half put strip pretty much all the way from uh, yeah it's from april to may june july august september in October, we see three half puts doing actually the exact same amount, 2,575. So it looks like this is indeed related paper, listeners. Wow. Trading 1,125 on Wednesday, 1,450 today. It's like it might be some related. So there might be some flies going up here. The two puts going up 500 times, two and three quarter puts going up about 500 times, three puts going up about 500 times. So it seems like funky strips to the downside in just about every month of next year. <laughs> See, the metals don't have a monopoly on the weird paper, listeners. And let's look really quickly because Dan was breaking down crude oil. Let's get out there really quickly as well. Let's pop out of Nat Gas, go into that product family, go up to WTI, listeners. Crude oil will be at the top of the product family list. Let's see how much paper on the tape for WTI this week. A 380,000. It's a similar level that we see for Nat Gas. And again, this is a shortened holiday week. So that's actually a fair amount of paper. WTI coming into showtime, 116 and three quarters up about 1.5% on the week. So it wasn't our big mover and shaker for the week. Let's do a quick rundown here. The contract, the July contract with 14 days to go, doing about 29% of the paper. And let's see, the vol in WTI, 47 and a third, up about two and a quarter points. Uh, Skew-wise, we see the puts pretty much unched to their 3.8% bid last week, about 3.1% bid this week. The calls, no interest in the calls, 0.8% bid last, or cheap last week, I should say. 0.7% cheap this week. That makes sense. We are at astronomical levels. Kind of hard for people to get, I think, too super excited about buying the calls. And also, they don't want the risk still of selling them. So keeping their powder dry on the call wing, that seems to be reflected there in the skew. Let's see. In terms of action, it was the 110 puts that were leading the dance this week out here. And Actually, I take it back. 110 puts did 12,000. But if we go all the way down to June of next year, listeners, it's the 150s, the 150 calls. Dominating the tape. Looks like, again, we have a vertical, the 150-200 vertical going up 4,500 times on Tuesday, 800 times on Wednesday. And then I guess for good measure, they did another 8,800 of the 150s today and only 1,750 of the 200s today. So not quite a one-to-one vert, just a lot of action on the 150s. I don't know, Dan, what are your thoughts on the 150 200 vertical in WTI for June of next year, sir. Is that one of your recommended trades of the week? <laughs> uh, I got to tell you, Mark, that 
he does say something about attitude, does he? And it says something about the, the point of view of where things may shake out. And it's that longer term attitude that I find interesting. Uh, I don't see crude oil getting to those levels uh, at all. But, uh, you know, price dictates what we do, not what we feel. And uh, I, I find those levels really very interesting that someone has that kind of an opinion. Yeah. I mean, the 110 puts makes sense you know people want a safety net in there uh but boy those other ones that's a pretty optimistic outlook optimistic and or terrifying i guess pick your point of view (laughs) all right dan you regaled us with a lot of ag info at the top of the show but there's a lot going on in the ags a lot of our movers and shakers to the dark side this week are in the ag so i think we'll hang our hat there next It's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options, trades, and trends in corn, wheat, soybeans, and more. It's time to talk ags. All right, everybody, welcome to the ag section. Get on into that drop down, pop out of energy, go all the way up to the top of the asset class list for agriculture, obviously. Then pop on over to the grains and oil sea. That's where we're going to hang out today. Uh, Dan, you were just talking about the ags. We have Chicago and KC wheat, as well as oats, dominating our dark side. If you throw lumber in there, the softs, it's all pretty much all ags, with the exception of nat gas. So where should we begin our journey this week in the ags, and what is lighting up your tape out there this week, sir? Uh, just a quick one on lumber. Lumber kind of makes sense. If you think about some of our housing permits and uh, new housing starts and other things that we've seen over the last uh, few months, uh, getting a little softer does make sense. Our supply has gotten stronger. That's one of the main things. When we had the virus shut down, the lumber industry, we really felt that that shake through our entire construction uh, operations. But that's improved tremendously. So I think lumber is doing what it should do right now, and that is to stay relatively weak. Uh, but when it comes to the... Uh, to the wheat market itself, I just, I'm leery of it here, Mark. I, I think that in corn, uh, it's cheap, e- even though historically this is expensive, I should say, for wheat, for example, for Chicago wheat or Kansas wheat. But um, we're coming into a time where there's usually a, a fairly consistent rhythm when it comes to wheat. Uh, If you look at six out of the seven last years, August, uh, that market had uh, Chicago wheat uh, was up in August, six out of seven of our last years. And uh, so is that a tendency we're going to see coming down the road? And that attitude, I think you and I could see reflected in the options as we go further out. Is that building? Do we see option positions building on an optimistic uh, point of view. Uh, So the wheat markets, including uh, Kansas, uh, you know, Kansas is a higher protein wheat. So it usually trades at a premium to Chicago wheat. Uh, So that that differential we expect to be maintained. Uh, If that changes, then it may say something about spreading opportunities uh, in the futures markets as well as in the options market. So I I find that an interesting complex to uh, keep an eye on. That it certainly is. Let's get out there and find out for ourselves what is going on. By the way, if you're curious, the differential between Kansas City wheat and Chicago wheat listeners, KC Wheat does about 13,000 contracts on the tape right now versus Chicago wheat, about 90,000. So we're going to hang out there, plus Chicago wheat higher on our dark side movers and shakers this week. Get into the ags, go on to the grain and oil seeds, pop on into SRW wheat. That's where you'll find this, listeners. Again, about 90,000 contracts on this truncated holiday week. So pretty decent paper, all things considered. Uh, Dan mentions he kind of thinks it feels cheap, even though we are at kind of historically high levels. That level translates to about a 1061 and a half right now, off about 8.3% on the week. Again, if you go back to last week's show, it's only off about 6.8%. Uh, let's see, in terms of where we are right now, again, about 1061 and a half. There's a contract going away in about a day. We're not going to hang out there, listeners. Instead, we're going to go out about 22 days to the July contract. That did exactly 50, 50.0%. You never see that of this week's paper going up 
in that July contract. I do like the ags. They do seem to concentrate their liquidity in a couple of months. And it's usually not like the equities where they go away in like a day. So a little bit easier to parse from a vol and a skew perspective out here. But speaking of vol and skew, let's see what's going on out there. Almost a 39. That's the vol in the July wheat right now. So decently volatile, all things considered, up about a point. And again, that's to be understood. Wheat has moved quite a bit ever since the February invasion out there. So a little bit shy of 40. That sounds about right. Maybe you can argue it should be even higher given what we're seeing out there of late. Again, that's kind of a little bit more inflated than small cap equity vol, a lot more inflated than large cap equity vol, and even more inflated than some of the other commodities we've been talking about out here on the show. Skew wise last week, the puts 1.5% cheap. This week, 4.2% cheap. So the puts coming in, the calls last week, 4.1% premium. This week, 6.5% Six and a half percent premium. So calls getting bit up, puts coming in as we move down the skew curve. That's pretty much about what you'd expect. All things being equal out there. Let's go out to see what the what the big dog was. What was the hot option trade? Again, about ninety thousand contracts on the tape. We're at about a ten sixty one and a half right now in the futures. It was the par puts, the one thousand puts leading the dance this week with seven thousand one hundred and sixty eight contracts. The big day today, 3,157. Yesterday, 2,850. Tuesday, 1,161. Uh, pretty much opening all week. And again, that makes sense why that strike would capture the imagination. Even money strikes usually tend to dominate on these lists. And that's pretty much what we're seeing here. Let's see. After that, we have to go out actually to September to the 13 half call. So it wasn't all puts all the time. Calls also lighting up the tape in September. 13 halves. Looks like someone coming in and maybe closing these out. 13 halves doing 4,500 contracts. They're 14 halves doing 4,200 contracts this week. Almost all of that closing looks like they came in and took off a 13 half, 14 half vertical 2,500 times on Tuesday and about 2,000 times yesterday. Nothing today, so no action today. So it looks like they had some upside and uh, maybe they were fading the upside we saw in wheat, probably given the price action we saw, they probably were along that vertical. And I guess they're they're washing their hands of it now. If that's the case, then unfortunately, that one probably left a bit of a mark on them there. Uh, intriguing stuff. Let's look really quickly. Any other big prints lighting it up? 11 half calls, also pretty active out here in August. Let's see here. We already have... The wheat here. Let's go. We're kind of coming up again, so we have touched on a lot on ags already. So there you go, ag heads. You guys got quite a lot of content on the show this week. I'm sure we have more coming up. Probably have some questions about this. But let's keep on rolling right now. It's time to get into a little bit of the old equities. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, welcome to the equities section. You guys know how to find this. Go back into that report, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO. Pop on out of the ags, go down three more slots to the equity indices, and we'll go into U.S. Index E-mini in the product family, then down a few more in the product category. We can kick things off in Russell 2000. But Dan, one of the things I know a lot of our listeners have wanted to pick your brain about, given the fact that we're in such topsy-turvy markets out here in the broad equities is... You know, what are your thoughts on these levels? You know, we saw a very aggressive sell-off, particularly post-invasion out there, post-Fed, post-inflation, post-earnings in a lot of the broad equities. Since then, the last week and a half or so, we've kind of rebounded, at least in the near term, off the lows. What do you think about these levels we're seeing out there in the broad equities right now, sir? Well, I have to tell you, I'm on the bullish side. And uh, the reason is based on price action, not so much uh fundamentals uh if we look at it from a fundamental point of view we know what the fed's going to be doing we have an idea of their game plan to an extent and i think the market has kind of built that in uh the issue though is there is concern about going into a recession i am concerned about that too if you go too far too fast with uh interest rate increases we do have that potential however We've seen that in the past, but now, you know, our economy, we have inflation, no doubt about that. But our economy, the foundation to our economy, I don't think is in terrible shape. 
I mean, if you look at Jamie Dimon's presentation uh, yesterday or the day before. Yeah, what do you say? A uh, hurricane's coming for us, something along those lines? Well, he did. He did. But he also said, you know, we got the banks are in good, hold, uh, have a good foundation to handle that storm. And that if you look at deposit, there's about $2 trillion in private hands in accounts. So there's capital available. We know people are willing to spend it because of what we see in the housing industry, what we see in durable goods orders, which are things that last more than three years. It says something about their confidence. And so they have the money, they're willing to spend it, and they're doing that. Uh, some of the earnings reports we've seen coming out have been kind of a mixed bag. But if we look at what we're seeing here price-wise, uh, from my point of view, the, the reference that you and I had to look at goes back about five days ago and or four days ago. We had a large move to the upside as we finished the week out last week. And what's interesting about that, I call that a benchmark candle. It's just a Dan thing. And what I look at is how the market moves with respect to that move up. In other words, from my point of view, buyers came in and gave us that strong close, and they're willing to hold going into a holiday weekend those positions. Now, this week, we want to see how does the market move with respect to that big move on Friday. If it stays above the midpoint, it implies a bullish bias. If it takes longer to come down towards the bottom of that big green candle, for example, 50, uh, 40, 50 in uh, the S&P, uh, that would imply that if it takes, let's do it this way. If what we did in one day, it takes three days to cover that range to the downside. It implies a bullish bias. It implies profit taking. And right now, that's the way these indices are behaving. So broad in terms of S&P, NASDAQ, Dow, and Russell, uh, we're seeing those buyers coming back in. You know, Mark, I think the important thing for us is going to be the next three trading sessions. If what we're seeing today says what we saw earlier in the week was profit taking, now buyers are returning to the market. That means that in the S&P, we should be closing above 4,200 in the next two to three sessions. If we are, we're going out the way we came in. That's the kind of action that we want to see. We also want to see an example of that confidence as we go into this coming weekend. On Friday do we back, or tomorrow, do we back off or do people come in and we close at the high like we saw last Friday? I think it's an attitude that we're seeing when we see that kind of action. NASDAQ, the same thing, 13,000 is going to be the magic number. 33,500 in the Dow. We want to close above that by the end of the week or by the close of Monday. And over in our friend, Mr. Russell, uh, we want to see that closing above 1900, 1920 to 1930. I think if we see that kind of action, that actually implies further movement to the upside. Uh, and it's kind of amazing, I think, that we're seeing that kind of price action. For me personally, I, you know, I have an opinion about the market, but my opinion is just that price dictates what we do, I think that's a final filter. And even though I could be bearish a market, if it's going up, I want to be long. Uh, and because price is what puts money in our pocket and takes money out of our pocket. So for me, the final filter is what is price doing today? And right now it implies movement to the upside. Well, Dan, I, you are probably like the fifth person in the last week to come on the network and tell me they think they've seen the bottom here in the broad equities, which is kind of interesting. And again, a little bit fascinating, again, with given how, how much we got beat up. And you're right, that 4,200 level was very critical to the downside. It took us a while to break it, kept bouncing off of it, kept bouncing off of it. Now, if we can close above it out there in the S&P, that'll certainly be a level to watch. Speaking of things to watch, let's look at the vol levels out here. 
And again, spoiler alert, they're all down since this time last week. RBX flirting once again with the 30 handle. It was north of it for quite some time, flirting with 40. Now, about a 30 and a quarter when we kicked off the show. Puts it down about one and a half points from where it was this time last week. VIX Cash, if you've been listening to the rest of the network, you know that's much lower as well. Shy at 25 now, 2460. So we are out of the logins danger zone as we speak. That puts it down about 26 on the week vvix 89 and a quarter another historically important level below 100 for the first time in over a year and only really the second or third time since the start of the pandemic so very interesting stuff there that's down almost six points from this time last week vol q so the at the money ball of the nasdaq 31 and three quarters down about two and a half points that puts that vix to rbx spread 562 that's about one and a quarter points wider so widening out a bit since last show and the vix to vol q so the S&P to NASDAQ vol spread seven, almost 7.2 points. That's about 2.6 points wider than last week. So both of those vol spreads, large cap to small cap, and the S&P to NASDAQ spreads widening out a fair bit this week. What's on the tape out here in the land of small caps? Let's find out. Again, a truncated holiday week. Uh, we are seeing net up on the week, a whopping four handles <laughs> in the Russell 2000. So net on the week, it's up. A little bit more. I think it was up about three and a half percent since our last show, about two and a third percent, actually. So, yeah, but right now, since the start of the week, not a heck of a lot of net movement in the Russell 2000. Let's see, of the action here, we see about 40 percent going up in actually mid month. Looks like, yeah, it looks like the June contract that has about 15 days to go. We're at about an 1889.90 right now, by the way, listeners, in small caps. So, still shy of that 2000 level. Vol right now in this contract here in small caps, about 2890. So that lines up pretty closely to what we're seeing out there in RBX land a few points away. Again, you're always going to see a little bit of a difference because there is that fudge factor in the VIX methodology that incorporates skew and a few other things there. In terms of skew, speaking of which, speaking of skew, uh, the puts last week 10.3% bid. This week coming in a little bit, 9.2% bid. So not quite as bid this week as they were last week. Uh, the calls last week, 9.5% cheap. This week, about 10%. So the call is pretty much hanging out. The puts getting a little bit cheaper on the week. And in terms of action this week, it was actually the 1,700 puts I said in expiring here in, Ju- in June. Again, we're at about almost an 1,890. These are the 1,700 puts doing close to 1,000 contracts this week. The big day was Monday. Actually, I take it back Tuesday. Obviously, we were closed Monday. So the big day was Tuesday, 500 on Tuesday, a few hundred today, the rest scattered throughout the week. Looks like actually a bit of a vertical, 1,700, 1,800 put vertical going up about 500 times on Tuesday and then scattered times throughout the week. Interesting. One-to-one on, on Tuesday and then again, kind of different ratios throughout the week. 1,800, 1,700 put vertical. You like that, listeners? If so, how do you like it? Buying it or selling it? Hit us up. Let us know what you think. Speaking of letting us know, uh, let's see. We're kind of coming up against this. So, yeah, let's go out there next. I think it's time for your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider radio network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, welcome to the Futures Options Feedback. This is, of course, the portion of the show where you guys take the reins, your questions, your comments. Uh, we have some polls and other stuff to get to. I'm going to get this one really quickly from the chat. You kind of touched on this earlier, Dan, but if you have any other thoughts, uh, Unlimited in our chat wants to know, what does Dan the man, Grams, <laughs> think about fertilizer's impact on the ag, sir? <laughs> First off, you, you like that nickname? And then uh, he wants to know if you have any additional, you kind of touched on this earlier in the show, if you have any additional thoughts on what's going on with fertilizer and the impact on the ag market, sir. Well, that is an interesting uh, moniker, but um, I have to tell you, the it, it's to be felt 
you know, we're, we're coming into the next few months where I think the economic impact of not having enough fertilizer is going to be felt. You know, it's actually, it's being felt right now because people have to make a decision. If In fact, your products should already be in the ground right now uh, because, you know, we have a growing window here just like they do in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, we have some, like for corn, we have some hybrids that can be planted a little bit later. But anyways, the issue is how much did you plant and what would help you make that decision? Well, the difference in cost between different between corn and wheat and uh, beans that has an impact. Uh, the U.S. dollar has an impact. Are we going to be able to sell what we produce, or is it too strong? And can we support the product that we have in the ground or that we're going to plant? We need fertilizer, and if the cost goes up because that supply is shrunk. Uh, is it going to make economic sense for us to do that? And that's a tough decision. And so I don't think we're really going to feel the impact of what fertilizer shortages and increase in pricing has had until we get to harvest time. That's why I think the next few months are going to be critical. Because when it comes to harvest, it may be we don't see as much as people are contemplating. And that's going to have, again, another layer of impact globally and also on inflation and all the other things get tied in there. So fertilizer, you know, I think it's one of those key elements that's going to have a longer term impact on the eggs. Well said, sir. Let's go out to this next one here from Jim. Jim Iyer. hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Jim. He says... Uh, Mark, just listened to the show with Rich Excel on Twifel. That was our last week's show where we got into all those uh, funky ag flies out there, the ag calendar flies, which were kind of interesting. I know a lot of you had thoughts on that. He says, do you have the report he did for those calendar flies? Yes, we did. He did our whole write-up on that. We kind of mentioned it during the show. We did tweet out and put in our live chat for our pro members uh, the link to that. That's readily available. Our producers, I'll make sure uh, they send it out to you, Jim, if they haven't done so already after receiving your question. So you will get access to that report. It's pretty interesting. He breaks down all the strikes and the vol levels and why he's intrigued by those levels. Uh, he has a second question. He says, also, how can you tell when, for example, if someone with the SKU, say the 25 Delta calls are buying to open or selling to close, you are still buying the call to move the 25 Delta to a higher price, right? Thanks, Jim. Well, yeah, Jim, if I can read between the lines of your question there. That is a little bit more challenging on a show like this with Twifel than it is, let's say, in the equity options marketplace. Usually we have that broken down for us very easily and readily with the opening and closing on, on the equity side. We have that to a degree here in the, in the premium reports. If you guys go over to Bantix and check it out, it, the earlier days, it will tell you whether that is opening or closing. So that helps us uh, from that perspective. One of the things, reasons I mentioned why it's more challenging on the futures option side is we don't really have as much insight into the execution as we do on the equity option side. If I see a big print go up and let's say Tesla options, for example, I can go see exactly when that went up. I can see the price. I can see where that was on the bid offer spread. If they were lifting the offer, if they were hitting the bid, if they were working it somewhere in the middle, I also will obviously know if it's opening or closing. And that will help give me more insight into what's going on out there with the futures options. You don't have that same level of granularity. I can't tell if they're hitting bids or lifting offers. You have to do a little bit more legwork to try to ferret that out. And it's not always easy to do live on a show like Twifa. So we don't always know that, especially for stuff that's going up the same day. And oftentimes our show day is an active day. So we can't tell exactly what is going on. But that said, your supposition that someone, if they come in and they're buying to open a bunch of those 25 Delta calls, then yes, that is going to move the vol levels of the upside call wing. That's going to move that higher. So yes, that's, that's one of the ways we kind of interpret that. We look at the skew, right? And we could see right away if the skew is collapsing in the put wing of a certain option, you could usually reasonably intuit that there is some selling <laughs> selling activity going on, whether folks are coming in to sell to close and take off positions, or they are crushing and selling to open new positions. Either way, a ton of selling activity is going on. That's going to drive down 
the implied volatility levels in that put wing. Same thing with the call wing. If we see a lot of buying activity, then it's going to drive up the vol levels and it's you know, vice versa if they come in and sell a lot of it. So that's also a way we can kind of look at the skew. And if we can't tell if it's, let's say, a lot of same-day paper, and we can't reasonably tell if we see a bunch of call strikes going up and the calls are suddenly far more expensive this week than they were last week, that's usually a good sign that there was a lot of buying paper going on on that strike. So, yes, your supposition is correct, Jim. Uh, keep listening. If you want to join us in the live, you can ask these questions live there for yourself, and our producers will get that report out to you Post haste. All right, we've got time for one more here, Dan. Uh, let's go out to, uh, I like this handle, Hedwig. Hedwig223. He says, we saw a big retail or small lot trading boom in stock and index options last year. Did that volume also carry over into commodity options? And was it the same type, predominantly call buyers, or was it more mixed? Well, Mr. Dan, if you have any thoughts here, or first off, if you have anything you want to add to Jim's question about, how can we tell if things are opening and closing and the impact on the skew? Have at it. And then B, if you have anything to add here for Hedwig, wants to know, did we see a similar retail trading frenzy in the commodity options that we saw in the equity options last year? Well, first on A, uh, no. I think it was a great question that Jim had, and you did a terrific job answering it to give that insight in terms of what's going on. On B, yes, I would say we have. You know, when the, the CME launched the micros on the indexes back in May of 2019, um, my first thought, and actually other exchanges, Eurex also had a micro, but when we look at what happened at the CME group, what, what I was looking for is to see where does that volume come from? Is it the mini contract, all those, the volume there just shrinks? And it goes over to the micro contract. So it scavenged, uh, you know, volume from the mini contract. Not the case. It didn't do that at all. And what we see is this new volume coming into the micro. Well, who's that? And my belief is that it's that equity trader. You know, the cost to put on a micro position is so much less. If you look at crude oil, talking about commodities, uh, it's eight and eight thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars to put on a crude oil contract margin, and it's eight hundred and eighty dollars if you're doing a micro position. So your cost to establish a position is greatly lower, and your exposure per tick is about one tenth. So going back to the the, uh, the S and P 500, it goes from 1250 down to a dollar and a quarter. Here's what's fascinating to me: 1.4 billion micro futures contracts have traded since May of 2019. I remember being at the exchange, and in the first five days, they did six million contracts. Holy Toledo! 28 percent of that volume is transacted from participants outside the United States, and that's what I find. And 20 percent of that volume comes across before the U.S. cash open, before the stock market. Now let's d go back to commodities. That that was the question, and the one that I think is really interesting to look at. Check this out, and that is look at the micro crude oil. Uh, futures. If you think about what's happened there, um, back in February 9th, they had just been open a few weeks. They did about 10 million plus contracts. Well, just a few weeks later, they have done over 20 million contracts. 40% of that volume came from outside the United States. So what that means to me is that you and I have the ability to establish positions and work a position either for trade entry, trade exit, risk management outside what we think of as the U.S. trading hours. And there's people out there trading it. So that means there's liquidity. That means you and I can get in and get out. So I think it does provide new opportunities, and I think those options are going to reflect that. Uh, so, yes, I do think the participants that have come into the market, starting with those stock indices, we are seeing them bleed over into, you know, currencies and metals and the energy market more so than we ever have in the past. 
And I think that trend's going to continue. The pool of equity traders that realize hmm, maybe there's an alternative investment are recognizing it. And so I think this volume flow that we're seeing uh, is just the beginning of strength that's going to continue. Well said, Mr. Dan. Unfortunately, that music means that's all the time we have to answer your questions. Keep them coming. We love to hear from you folks. If for some reason they come in uh, too late to answer them here or something, we can always try to work them onto another program or get you on the show for next week. But we love all your questions. Keep them coming. Again, Dan, unfortunately, it's amazing how quickly an hour flies by when I'm chatting with uh, Dan the Man Gramza, as our chat likes to call him here. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Dan, if folks want to do more chatting with you, check out some of your videos in between your appearances on the show here. Where should they go? What should they do? Well, they could go to dangramza.com. Uh, on that website, I have a free video. It lasts about two to three minutes. I look at 22 different markets. And uh, you'll see red and green lines, which represent buy and sell levels. From my point of view, these are not buy and sell recommendations. I'm just trying to share how I would look at these markets. And the idea is if you've never traded futures, a place to begin, just watch them. Get a feel for how they move. You know, it may not be as crazy as a lot of people think uh, in terms of their movement. Or if you're only trading stock indices, maybe you'll find out that crude oil or currencies or energy uh, or ags uh, or interest rates, those are the markets that I cover, uh, may be of interest to you. So it, there may be some other opportunities for your own personal trading. So that that's a place to uh, check out some additional ideas I try to share on a daily basis. There you go. Check them out. Dan Grams at G-R-A-M-Z-A dot com is the place to go. Of course, you know where to go. Check out these reports we run for you this week and a whole bunch more. See me group dot com slash Twifo. And of course, last but certainly not least, it's coming up on that time, listeners. It's coming up on Recon Time. We'll be checking in with those folks soon over there at FTSE Russell. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about Recon for yourselves, what's going on from a vol perspective, correlation perspective, how's COVID perhaps impacting or not impacting small caps earnings, a whole bunch more. FTSE Russell.com, F-T-S-E Russell.com is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. Give them a follow on the old socials as well, at FTSE Russell, F-T-S-E Russell, all one word over there. On Twitter is a good place to start. Unfortunately, that's the end of our broadcast day today. But we'll be back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, to break down this mad week from a volatility perspective. Then for all you cool kids in the Secret Club, back again after that for a little bit of the old options oddities. Take care out there, listeners. Stay safe over this weekend. We'll see you back here next Thursday, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftseRussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications.
You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 